Hayes Park following interruption for public service announcement. Welcome to Investing Intelligence, where we talk about artificial intelligence, companies, stocks, and trading. I'm James, here with my co-host Kai, and today we'll be talking about Broadcom. I want to remind you that the opinions expressed on this show are just that, opinions. They should not be taking a specific advice to invest in a particular way. How are you feeling today, Kai? I'm good. You know, there are opinions when we're not right, like 100% of the time. I will say 98, 99% of the time. James is, an, is a set opinion because James's opinions are right about maybe 55, 55% of the time, about the same percentage that a good tennis player would have in, in scoring a lot of the points. That's what James' success rate is. So my opinions are just facts. Let's just get let's just get that straight right off the bat. So since you since you started with that, I decided to go ahead and pull up a report that I sent you last September. And as you can see, it so I made a little joke on the report and I wrote at the top Kai and James Capital Limited, which there's no such thing, but just as a joke, I put that there. But you can see on the first page of the report, I wrote Nvidia current price $485. And the report is titled NVIDIA Call Option Analysis, September 4th, 2023 is a date. So I pretty much went through what it would cost to buy calls on NVIDIA at that price and then what your profit might be. So you see here, I have in this paragraph, one year call, it would cost you about $7,800 and it yield you $33,000 in profit if NVIDIA went to 1,012. And we know that NVIDIA is currently at about 1,300 if you don't take the stock split into consideration. It's actually a 130 something because they did the 10 for one stock split. But uh, essentially you would have made way more than that uh, $33,000 per $7,000. So what is that? I mean, insane profit. So since you wanted to make a joke about how right I am, how often I'm right, um, I thought I'd just go ahead and pull this up and show you. Just a little, little walk down memory lane for you here, Kai. Yeah, you know, we'll chalk that into the 55% and we'll give you the Vegas odds. I'm way about 55%, you know, like, thank you. This is like James Roulette. I think it's what, you know, Roulette is uh, 50, 55%. James will take take the house odds. But um, yeah, so what, I mean, NVIDIA on a tear. And we got to spend just a second talking about NVIDIA. So when does it stop? I mean, I, I was hoping, you know, I had taken profits on NVIDIA. I don't hold a position in NVIDIA and it's like, my tears are just you know, coating my entire face right now. I've been just waiting each day for a time to be able to get into this one. And it's just not, it's not formed a handle. It's not what the world, James, I thought yesterday was going to pull back. You know, do you have a position in NVIDIA? You have a pretty. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Of course. So NVIDIA is my second largest position. SMCI is my first largest position. They kind of compete just like NVIDIA and Apple and Microsoft are competing for number one in my personal portfolio, NVIDIA and uh, NVIDIA and SMCI compete for number one with my largest holdings. But yeah, no, NVIDIA, I just don't see a reason to sell it because I feel like your downside is so limited. I just feel like it just can't really crash down. I know it has so many times had like its 10% pullbacks, but look, we've revalued so much higher. I mean, we're up what, 300% from the number I just showed you where we started getting into it last year. So I just don't feel like there's a massive downside at this point. Um, so I don't have any, I don't have a big reason to sell it. Yeah. No, I mean, we both had positions in NVIDIA. I had taken my profits prior to the previous earnings. I trade, I kept my, uh, when you, when you say take profits, I want to know what you mean. Cause I've been trimming a little bit. I've been trimming like 1% here, 1% here, 1% there. So when you say taking profits, do you mean like you sell the whole thing and wait for it to go down again? Cause I, I don't do that. Yeah. I, before, before, no, I, and I don't, I don't suggest every, and this been since this is another one of the 55% of the time James is correct. Um, it may be better in certain instances to go ahead and mitigate your risk by either hedging your position, right? Or potentially taking partial profits. I had, I took all my profits before NVIDIA's last earnings call. It was like the Super Bowl Sunday. I mean, there's a lot of Super Bowl earnings calls. However, I took, I took at least my NVIDIA profits prior to the last time, uh, to their last earnings call. Um, I mean, you and I have talked about this position multiple times. This, NVIDIA dropped to, but act, last October, it was what? Three was it in the three hundreds? It dropped pretty substantially. Yeah, I think I I don't have the chart in front of me right now, but um, so what I what I've done, I mean, it's practically paying me a dividend because it goes up by three percent, six percent, whatever, and then I sell like 
one to three percent and I usually spread out my selling over a few days. So it's almost like I'm getting paid a, a big old dividend by just selling a little bit. Now, technically, you know, I have less and less shares because the, the share price is going up, but I'm selling. So technically, I have less and less shares, not considering the stock split, um, but I still have the same amount of money in the stock. Most people wouldn't do that, I guess. But oh well, I don't know. It depends on how you rebalance. Like people have different strategies for rebalancing their portfolio, but that's my personal strategy. But do you want to jump into to Broadcom? Should have, would have, could have. Let's talk about Broadcom in a second, but should have, would have, could have for all this. And we, James and I are joking a lot about this, of course, and we don't recommend going all in in one position. However, there was very serious consideration back in October of 2023. James and I talked about putting all of our position in NVIDIA. I did do that. <laughs> I actually did do that, but... Um... Yeah, but, but anyway, yeah, le James is leveraging it and everything. But yeah, so one of the players or um, AI players that is a big part of this market, I would, I would actually start to include this particular player. I think this particular player also surpassed like Tesla in market cap and a lot of other big, big players in NASDAQ and S&P is AVGO. And we talked a lot about this in our last episode. We wanted to talk about this, especially with Apple, but AVGO also on a tear, way above its 21 day moving average, way above we're at like 1800. We obviously have a stock split coming up July 12th. I want to hear James's take. So let's just say one thing, James, first of all, what is, if you had to summarize in two sentences, what AVGO does, maybe a few things. And then number two, I want to hear what James has taken as a price target for AVGO and where it's currently at in the market at around 1800. Um, so what they do, I can sum it up in one word, everything. Um, they do software, they do wireless chips, they do networking chips, they do a lot of different things. So everything would be how I would sum up what they what they do. But I, I just want to emphasize that they're a big partner of Apple. So there's about $20 of Broadcom technology in every iPhone. That includes the Wi-Fi chip, the Bluetooth chip, and something called FBAR. Uh, so we'll just call it the F-bar for, for simplicity's sake. But just know that Broadcom is pretty much the only one that does the F-bars. There's maybe a couple others, but they're pretty much in a monopoly with the F-bar. So $10 of the $20 is just the F-bar. And what the F-bar does is it cuts down on interference for your cellular for signal and for other signals. So you don't get interference on the... Um, on the on the signal on the um what's it called uh where like you have a certain signal <laughs> so well i mean acronyms with broadcom are a little confusing frequency me. frequency is what i was the, looking the for stock ticker yeah yeah you're looking for the frequency but you've got the the f bar but just explain to me just the basic premise of broadcom and how the stock ticker became avgo like where did, where did that come from? Go ahead and explain that one to me. So founded in 91 in California, but then this company called Avago bought them out. Uh, now Avago is based in Singapore. So they temporarily relocated to Singapore. I want to say from 2016 to 2018. And then in 2018, they, they were trying to acquire Qualcomm, but pretty much the US government shut it down because they were headquartered in Singapore. And you know, Singapore's a um, Singapore is not China, but it's closer. And Hock Tan, the CEO, is essentially Chinese or Malaysian. And so, yeah, so it's Chinese links essentially is what we get down to. And then they decided to re-headcore to um, Nearshore back to the U.S. And they are, they are um, headquartered in, the, in California once again. So that's a little bit of history. But they're, they're Broadcom now. They're not Avago. They're Broadcom now but yeah they tried to acquire Qual qualcomm that didn't work out they did acquire vmware but that took forever eventually worked out weren't sure if it was gonna work out for a long time but it finally did work out so yeah does that answer your question on that yeah so stock ticker is avgo was um because a company they essentially changed their name to broadcom but was purchased or acquired correct from uh, the avago acquired and so it became Broadcom, but they kept the stock ticker AVGO. And so, so jack of all trades and master of none with AVGO here, Broadcom, or what? Yeah, I, I think so. Now, it's interesting, they're, they're AI chips. So you, I believe, refer, them, refer to them as ASICs. So they're doing specialized AI chips, and that's a different, that, that's a significant difference from what 
NVIDIA is doing. So NVIDIA is making GPUs and they're focusing on generalized computing with their GPUs. But Broadcom's AI chips are really focused on specific things. So Google and Meta are two of the really big customers and Google and Meta employ Broadcom to build AI chips that focus on specific workloads for those companies. So for example, Meta might want to have AI built into their advertising algorithms. They might want to have AI that figures out exactly what you're looking at so they can provide you better ads. Well, they might contract with Broadcam to make a chip specifically for that need that's really good at doing just that. So that's not what NVIDIA is really focusing on, although NVIDIA has announced they're trying to get into specialized chips, but that's a new thing for NVIDIA, not an old thing. Broadcom is a leader in that kind of AI chip. Yeah, so look, just to summarize a little bit, this ASICs is this application-specific circuitry, right? So basically, they... I, I wanted to. I was hoping you were going to debate me on the jack of all trades, master of none, because I do think that they own quite a bit of a market share. I don't know if own is the appropriate, but they eighty they have eighty percent of this market share in regards to application specific circuitry that is utilized in a lot of the big player circuits or to utilize this technology. So not only is it you mentioned Google and Meta, but I believe Apple and Microsoft are big customers as well of Broadcom. So this ASICs, this sort of this application specific circuitry was initially developed, I think for video gaming, correct? Kind of in the same way that um, NVIDIA was in, in video gaming in their GPUs, Broadcom in, in regards to this specific circuit development is a player there. Yeah. So, yeah. So you talked about the, the partners and that's an important part of, of what they do because Apple is a pretty huge percent of their overall revenue. Apple's like 20% of their overall revenue, but I don't believe that Apple is 20% of their AI ASIC purchasing. So that's mostly Meta and Google, and there is a third player. I don't know if they've announced that third player. If someone knows, put it in the comments for us, but I don't know if they've actually announced that that third buyer. But keep well, in mind, some people are talking about I here here's the rumor and I don't know, some people could check is is bike dance. So TikTok, right? The is bike dance. So I I believe that one of their particular customers is bike dance has been rumored or yeah, please leave us in a comment. That may be something we need to look up, but bike dance. Well, interesting. I had not heard that, but do keep in mind that semiconductors are only 58% of their revenue and of that 58% they have some pretty significant declining segments. So their non-AI chips are down 30% overall year over year. If we, we could break that down smaller into like wireless chips, um, into service storage revenue, things like that, industrial, industrial resale, that's down 10% over year over year. Um, broadband down 39% year over year. So they have some decline segments, but here's the thing that, that makes me bullish on Broadcom. By the way, I don't have a position right now. I used to have a position. I sold it at the beginning of the year due to bad earnings reaction. But look, the thing that makes me bullish right now is that Hawk Tan says those declining segments are bottoming out. So we might actually see better earnings and we might see good earnings revisions. Actually, Kai, I'd like to just play you one question on the earnings call. I'd like to just play, this just takes about 30 seconds. It's gonna be Hawk Tan's response to a question that he got during the earnings call, which was just last week, if, I, if I'm if i correct about that. Um, so let's just listen to his response to this one question. Hi guys, uh, thanks for taking my question. I wanted to ask about the $11 billion AI guide. Um, you'd be at 11.6 even if you didn't grow AI from the current level in the second half, and it feels to me like you're not suggesting that. It feels to me like you think you're going to be growing. So why wouldn't that AI number be a lot more than 11.6? It feels like it ought to be. Or am because, I missing something? Because I guided just over eight, eight over 11 billion. They say it could be what you think it is. Uh, you know, it's the quarterly shipments get sometimes very lumpy. And it depends on rate of deployment, depends on a lot of things. So you may be right. You may, be, you may, get, you may uh, spe uh, estimate it better than I do, but the general tra trajectory is, is getting better. Okay, I'm gonna pause it there. Um, this guy's kind of funny, this, this, uh, he curses 
on the earnings call. Hawk Tan curses on the earnings calls, but he's kind of kind of a funny guy. But a lot of people think that he's lowballing the projections, and that's kind of what you hear him almost admitting to on the earnings call. He says, "You might be, you might be right. It might be higher. You might be right." So, so I mean, dude, he's just he's just very well. So I actually like Hawk Tan a lot. I I've enjoyed listening to him in the in the clips that I've listened to, especially during their last earnings call. I was able to actually try to read through and listen to a few of those, not probably extensively, but I'd say one thing that I really do like about them is they're th just this sort of application specific circuitry that's really being utilized. And as, all, as well as in regards to these build out phases of AI, high speed, high speed network, network, sorry, high speed networking. I don't know why that was food vault there. It's all difficult to say. Everything was, is difficult to say. Uh, high speed networking, high speed networking, but this high speed networking is a big part of their business. Correct. Yeah. So when we talk about high speed networking, they have a relationship with Cisco and Arista. So I was initially concerned they were competing, but it sounds like they actually supply networking chips to Cisco and Arista. So I, I think they do have competition from Marvell and optical transceivers. Uh, and apparently NVIDIA and Intel are competing with them on data processors. So there, there are some competing yeah, there are some there are some competitors here on some of their different segments, like Marvell. Well, th their customers like them. I mean, one of the things that's a big strength of Broadcom, especially since 2016, is their gross margins are really good. They actually are very profitable. Um, it's actually my number one positive of Broadcom, and we can talk about price target. Maybe be I want to get your opinion on that at the end, but. Number one for me is really their revenue growth and as well as their gross margin. And why I look at gross margin is because it, it gives a picture of profitability of a company. The other thing is they cash, excellent cash. They're very diverse in what they do, which is, is good in a company. And I'll take the one, I think it's a 1.2% dividend they offer. I mean, there's not a lot of AI plays that offer a div dividend like Broadcom right now. Yeah, so a couple of things you said there. I, I do like that. Well, I mean, it, it. so Broadcom returns value to shareholders in different ways. They do share buybacks and they do a dividend, which is awesome. But also they've used money for acquisitions historically. So acquisitions have been a big part of how they build value in their company. Like VMware, you mentioned. But yes, and VMware is probably their largest acquisition. That's 300,000 customers they, they picked up through that acquisition. The problem is what happens when the US government starts to block acquisitions? We know that we have an administration right now that is very anti-merger and acquisition, very anti-monopoly, if you want to call it that. So I, I'm concerned yeah, that- I mean, they're going after NVIDIA already? I mean, come on. I mean, slow your roll here. I mean, why are you going after NVIDIA? I think that's a way, is very preemptive. I mean, especially when you have other, I mean, you've got bigger- I mean, not to say bigger fish to fry, but come on. I mean, going after NVIDIA already? Yeah, so that's a concern. I, I agree with you. Look, so when you talk about valuation, different sectors typically have different standard valuation ranges. So healthcare typically has PE ratios between 15 and 25. Financials, usually 10 to 15 PE ratios. Energy might be 10 to 15. Utilities, 10 to 20. I'm reading off of chat GPT what it says are the typical PE ratios. Now, technology usually has a higher PE ratio, often 20 to 30 or even higher due to high growth expectations. But here's what a lot of people have been talking about recently. There might be a different PE range for AI companies. <laughs> so if 10... Well, we have not seen the growth that we've seen with some of these companies like NVIDIA for quite a long yeah, time. Yeah, if 20 to 30 is the general tech PE ratio range... I would honestly say that 30 to 36 might be the right PE range for a dominant AI player. And they, Broadcom, can I say Broadcom's a dominant AI player? I'm not sure if I can say Broadcom's a dominant AI player because it, it's a small percentage, small, small, small. It's a, it's a significant but not dominant percentage. It's a significant but, but not majority percentage of their overall revenue that comes from AI. Um, so they are an important AI player, but they're not NVIDIA. So let's, let's just get down to the numbers here. 2023 EPS was like 35 ish. 
uh, 33 to be specific. I think 2022 in the 20s, uh, 2021, it, it was 15. So with that PE ratio for tech or AI plays, what's your price target for Broadcom? I'm just going to keep a price target of 1600 I, My short answer is I don't know. I know it's already significantly above that. Well, I mean, I, th I think there's some analysts out there, and I again, I'll, I'll use... James and I as analysts here, but there are some people that are expecting an EPS growth of almost 70 or EPS to hit 70 in a few years. So, um, yeah, I think right now the PE it's trading at is like, is it 80? Is it's pretty high. You're t well, obviously we have to differentiate the trailing and the Ford P. So trailing PE is 79 Ford. Yeah. Ford P is 39. I think you have to use forward PE Okay, so let's use a Ford, uh, you know, right now Broadcom. And the, for the listeners out there, we're, make, we're multiplying EPS times PE ratio. And so to try to calculate somewhat of our price targets, right? And so um, Broadcom's at 1800 right now. In what world, in what scenario do we go higher than that? I mean, I, I think we've kind of hit our price target for the year, have we not? So the high estimate for next year's earnings, if you, if you want to do like the highest possible estimate, a high analyst estimate for next year's earnings is 69. When I multiply that by the 30, I'm not going to multiply it by 70. I'm going to multiply it by 39, which is the current PE. Um, so that's, <laughs> all right, guys, don't freak out, but 2691. So 2691 is next year's highest possible estimate for earnings multiplied by the current Ford P of 39, that comes out to 2691. So $2,700 is like the highest astronomical possible price target. Now keep in mind, Kai, you know, my price target in that little report we showed at the beginning, my price target for Nvidia, my highest possible price target for Nvidia was $1,000 in September of last year. And now we're at 1300 or with the stock split, we're at 130. Um, so the highest possible scenario can actually come true in this new world that we live in, this world of generative AI. So I don't want to say that it's not possible it can go to 2700, but if I'm going to be like Morningstar, Morningstar valuation, fair valuation is 1500. So somewhere between 1500 and 2700 is my, is my price target for, in other words, I don't know. I just don't know. Yeah, well, here's what I know. Okay, so I do, full disclosure, have a, pro, uh, a large position in AVGO or in Broadcom. Okay, James is not. I I kept my position in Broadcom. However, you know, this was one of those stocks for me or one of these plays that I, if I'm going long on um that if it drops, I'm going to gobble some of this up. I mean, the numbers on this look really well. The dividend is great. The there's diversification within the company in general. They have excellent cash, excellent gross margins just just right off the bat and they have good revenue growth. And so it's really market. Who knows where Broadcom is going to go? That depends on the market. However, just based on the numbers, um, right now it's a little high to chase, but on any pullback, if we get a 10% pullback, 15% pullback, which you know I think is going to ultimately come, you, I, that's something that I would put on my watch list. That's, it's going to be on my watch list, yeah. I would add to my position, yeah. Well, two things, two new things that I think we're saying today. The first new thing is that maybe... Maybe AI stocks are not subject to the traditional PE range of 20 to 30 for a tech company. Maybe 30 to 36 is their PE range. If that is the case, keep in mind Broadcom is even above that range because they're at 39 for, for forward PE. So a lot of future growth is already baked in to this current price where it's at. Now, the other thing I will say is that when you talk about these, these pullbacks, Stocks that have these higher valuations, tech stocks, higher risk assets will pull back more than the average when we have a pullback. So if if the index pulls back four or five percent, we may see Broadcom go down 10 or 15 percent in such a pullback. So I agree with you. I would love to snap some up on a pullback. I would love for it to be back closer to its fair valuation around 1600 or so whether or not we get that. Now, I think it was there before we had earnings. Didn't it jump 10% on earnings? So, you know, maybe it goes, maybe it, it goes back it's down. It's been on but... a tear. I mean, it's been on a tear. It really, Broadcom, I started, when it when it sort of went into this distribution phase and traded sideways, I started picking up even more shares. And so, and, it, and it's broken out 
it's broken out a little early for me because on July 12th is the stock split. It has a 10 to one stock split coming up on July 12th. So I would have liked it. I would have liked it to blo break out a little bit before that. And this would then be able to benefit from the stock split. It, maybe it'll pull back before then. Um, but stock splits are good because a 10 to one stock split, split will allow basically more people to purchase the stock because it'll be a more affordable price. False, that's a so, nice false narrative. That, that's the false narrative. So basically these narratives drive trading like the whole market is about narratives well, and, and maybe it drives this big maybe it drives maybe it drives it there's maybe this, it drives it that's okay i'll benefit from it so look but you're right you're right that it is a narrative that a lot of people believe in reality people can buy fractional shares now so for the public it doesn't really make any difference it's more for their own employees apparently there's some employee compensation things and it helps have a lower stock price but that in other words it doesn't really make any bit any difference except for a psychological difference. It's a narrative, but it's a narrative that works. And when a narrative works, you, you don't want to be a dummy and say, hey, it's a false narrative. If a narrative works, a narrative works. You know, price go up is price go up. Well, we should we should do a segment of the things James has been right at and the things James has been wrong at. One of the things you have been wrong out at for the listeners out there who own, had a position in a company called Arista Networks, who you've mentioned just a, a little bit ago in regards to Broadcom. Arista Networks at an all-time high. We talked about Arista Networks when it dropped to 240, and you equated Arista Networks to sort of the ancient of days, picks and shovels. But picks and shovels can be profitable, especially in regards to an AI build-out. Now, we haven't been back to earnings this next in start of July yet, but Arista Networks at all-time high. All-time high, James. Yeah, I'm looking at the chart for Arista right now. Pretty impressive I am I, another I, breakout. Yeah, another I, breakout. I have to force myself to take another look. Like when something like this happens, by the way, when I sell something and I sold a wrist and I sold Broadcom, that doesn't necessarily mean that I'm done with it forever. That wouldn't be a good investing. Come back to me. Come back to me. I broke up with you, but you well, need to come back to James. Yeah. And show, uh, James needs to show Arista Networks a little bit of love. I'm not saying go out and buy Arista Networks right now. I think Arista Networks you're chasing. And I think it, we we talked about the price target for Arista Networks on this show. And I think we're past that. I think Arista Networks is set for a pullback too. Well, their forward P is 43. I, I would take Broadcom over Arista. Now, once again, I need to go. Uh, I would. I would. Yes. I, yes. I need no, to listen correct. to you're Arista's correct. most recent call, but Arista versus I mean, well, Arista's benefiting from everything that is AI right now as well. Well, they don't do everything that is AI. I would say Broadcom and NVIDIA do more of everything that is AI than Arista. So Arista is a very small portion of the overall AI stuff. Well, they're benefiting from AI stocks and basically, basically the sector doing well. But there was some news, I think, with Arista. We may need to go back and look what the news was. Arista has done better in their third and fourth quarters of their uh, fiscal years, typically. So it dropped after earnings, I think when their first or second quarter, however, historically they've shown very strong third, fourth quarters. So um, maybe check out, put, put Arista Networks on your watch list. James is gonna look at it again. Also put AVGO, which is not named after Broadcom, but named after Avago. Also, I do not like the branding for Broadcom. I mean, I'm still going to go with Palantir. I'm still going to go with Tesla. I did not like the uh, uh, Vago symbol or uh, a Broadcom symbol. My last comment on Broadcom is just Hoctane is 71 years old. He's been a huge driving force for the company and its deal making, its acquisitions. So there is a bit of key man risk there with his age. Now, granted, it looks like we have a couple presidential candidates who are almost a decade older than Hawk Tan. So it's not like you can't do a job and do a do good with your job at that age. I'm not saying that, but we don't know how much longer he's going to stick around. It, it could be a negative headwind for Broadcom when he departs. But I'd like to just mention one thing on um, the overall market, but any other comments on Broadcom? No. I would watch out for unemployment this you and i talked about this but this last number was questionable if that's just one data point but if the data point becomes a trend which would take a couple more weeks we need to see this is the weekly weekly jobless report weekly jobs report rather we would need to see a couple more weeks of elevated claims and um yeah so new job creation elevated claims we need to see those numbers for the next couple of weeks and I, I think the market are you bullish this week are you bullish this week i mean treasury yields were down 
and and we've talked about previous previous episode. James's number one point is that ten year treasury yield, and my number one point has been the twenty one day moving average. For those out there listening and just sort of looking at where some of these stocks are in regards to that. Yeah, I lost you for a second. Yeah, so essentially, I would I would um on treasury fast years, money treasury yields are down. Yeah, these guys on fast money say every single week, hey, we expect yields to go higher. I know they're down right now, but I still think yields are going higher. And they do have one guy who's a technician, one of the few technicians I really, really respect on fast money. And he comes in and he says, guess what, guys? Yields are pretty much the same over the last year. Look at the one-year chart. Yields haven't moved. They're still in the same range over the last year. No movement. So this range is kind of healthy for stocks. We're not really going anywhere on the 10 year. And when we're at the bottom of that range, we seem to do a little bit better than when we're at the top of that range, like around 4.7, 4.8. Um, but I don't, I don't think we're going to go way up, in, you know, anytime soon, <laughs> even if we, if we get these bad jobs numbers, if they continue, you know, that's a weakening in the economy that will tell the fed to do a rate cut and then rates go down. The, the 10 year won't go down as much as the shorter, uh, rates that one year, two year, whatever the short end of the curve. But, um, but yeah, so the question is, is the economy really weakening or not? And I'm afraid that if we get these, if we get more negative data points on employment, I'm afraid people might start to think that we really are actually weakening. And then over a period of months, we could actually have a downturn. I'm not saying recession. I'm just saying we could have an actual pullback. I see that as being the potential next instigator for a pullback all right we'll add this to the let's just see see what happens that's the that's the beauty of the future that we can tally up the times james is wrong in regards to the future so we'll continue james's batting average is 5500 right now so I don't know. I don't know where you're coming up with my batting averages and, and why they're in thousands rather than tens. But let's just say my batting average has been a little bit better than other people's batting averages because uh, I went all in on AI stocks at the beginning of the year. But I would say my batting average is pretty high at this point. I'm not trying to brag, but I would yeah, say- Yeah, check out our website. I think I think one of the things that why we're doing this show is because we wanted other people to sort of profit from our research and our job is- to st steal the Jim Cramer line to make you money, right? What does Jim Cramer say? What is uh, my job is to make you money? Yeah. Is that the we've been wrong. I mean, I wasn't super crazy about J Frog, but we just to point out the ones that we've had that have gone really sour before we wrap up here. J Frog has gone really, really sour. Um, with pretty good numbers. J Frog, J Frog, pretty good numbers. I mean, I'm I've still maintained a position in J Frog. Do you still maintain a position in J Frog? Yeah, I do a smaller position, but that's pretty much the only loser that we've chosen is J Frog. Well, to be honest. And, well, Palantir, Palantir is still I way up. Palantir had well, it dropped after earnings. My point is, is even though it posted, and a lot of this is look at the facts. I mean, Pal Palantir posted pretty good earnings, but dropped substantially. I mean, it was like a twenty percent drop or something close to that. But however. Palantir is now right where it was trading almost prior to earnings. It's it's filled the it's uh, filled the gap nicely. So um, I actually bought pa more Palantir on the drop and have profited quite a bit from Palantir. I sold a call on Palantir and a put recently, both a covered call and a cash secured put. Um, I actually took my profits on my cash secured put today, and my my shares got called away. I only have a small position in Palantir now. So. Yeah, Palantir is one of those that has really good premium. So if you're into options and you want to sell options, you can get a pretty good premium with Palantir because it's it's more volatile, has has higher volatility. Well, it's something to look at. I mean, my APY, I think my strikes with my APY it was excellent premium, like sixty percent APY, of pretty out, pretty far out of the money. Or I mean, the with strikes that are pretty far away from the current price of the stock. So actually, APY, yeah, check out Palantir in regards to a trade. Maybe that's something to look at, especially right now. You know, so yeah, yeah, awesome. All right, well, thanks for listening to our show. Please give us a rating or review, or on YouTube, a like or comment. We'll be back in the next episode to cover more AI stocks. You can find all our holdings and trades at investingintel.ai. Thanks so much, Kai. Thanks, James.